My name is Joan Fitzgerald. I am the Dean of the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs, and I'm happy to welcome you all to the 11th Open Classroom. We started this series in 2008, have covered all kinds of topics, um, and uh, this semester, our topic, as you can see, is Policy for a Healthy America. So I was telling some of our uh, instructors for this about the history of the open classroom, and I said, we have a lot of regulars, so let me just ask a question. For how many of you is this your first open classroom? Okay, and how many of you are regulars? Yeah, okay. And is the couple whose date night it is here? <laughs> No? Okay. Well, hopefully, hopefully they'll, they'll come again. Um, I'm delighted that we have faculty from three of our colleges at Northeastern that are going to be leading the op open classroom this semester, and I'd like to introduce two of, you, two of them tonight. Um, Tim Hoff, who, who is here with us tonight, uh, holds a joint appointment with us in the School of Public Policy, but also in the Demore... Um, DeMore McKim School of Business here um, at Northeastern. His primary research interests are in the area of health policy and management. Specifically, he studies healthcare implementation, physician attitudes and behavior, the organizational and cultural aspects of healthcare delivery and behavior, uh, or healthcare quality and patient safety, rather, and changing modes of professional, professionalism. In 2012, he was named one of the 101 most influential prep professors of public health by the MPHprogramlist.com, an online service for public health education. He was also awarded this, I don't think this is on. He was also awarded the Outstanding Academic Title by Choice Magazine in 2010 for his book, Practice Under Pressure, Primary Care Physicians and Their Medicine in the 21st Century. This is Tim's second year at Northeastern, and we're delighted that he is leading in the course and the main instructor for, for uh, the classroom segment of this that has our, our own students registered. Uh, next is Wendy Parmet. She's an associate dean and, uh, for academic affairs and the George J. and Kathleen Waters Matthews Distinguished University Professor of Law. She's a leading expert on health, disability, and public health law. She directs the school's JD MPH program with Tufts University School of Medicine, as well as the program on health policy and law. Um, she is co-editor of the law school's SSRN online publications as well. Professor Parmet teaches public health health law and torts, and has published articles on public health, bioethics, discrimination, health law, and AIDS law. She is co-author of Ethical Health Care in 2005, Debates on Health Care in 2012, and Populations, Public Health, and the Law, published in 2009. Now I'm going to introduce our third professor, even though he's not here, you'll meet him next week. That's John Arbach. He's the Distinguished Professor of Practice and Director of the Institute on Urban Health Research. You might have heard of him before. He served as the Commissioner of Public Health in Massachusetts from 2007 to 2012 and as Executive Director of the Boston Health Commission from 1988 to 2007. And he was the state's leading AIDS government uh, governmental official during the early years of the epidemic. So we are quite pleased to have John with us on Northeastern faculty and as part of the open classroom. So without further ado, I will turn it over to our instructors for our first class tonight. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as um, Joan indicated, I'm, I'm fairly new to Northeastern and to the Boston area. I come from uh, uh, one of the most dysfunctional states in the Union, New York, great state of New York. 
um, where uh, we have no shortage of interesting health policy debates. Um, but I'm really happy to have landed here in, in Boston. I call it sort of the healthcare center of the universe, uh, at least in this country, I, I think it is. Um, and I'm very happy to be one of the instructors for this course. Uh, if you look, if you go online and look at the readings, just to put a plug in, I mean, we have some really good topics this uh, semester. Um, patient safety, uh, reproductive health, uh, single payer health care, uh, Obamacare next week, um, you know, uh, discussions of uh, big pharma and the FDA uh, uh, approval process, uh, the use of technology and healthcare innovation. So. Um, we really have a lot of interesting topics that the instructors, you know, we really sat down and thought carefully how to put together um, a semester that would be stimulating in terms of the diversity of issues that we talk about, but also things that are really at the center of health reform right now, um, issues that are touching upon some aspect of health reform. Uh, so anyway, just, you know, if you, if you go on the website, which I'm sure you probably already have, you'll see some of the different readings uh, <clears throat> that you can uh, tap into. For example, tonight we have a wonderful uh, reading, How American Healthcare Killed My Father. Uh, you know, <laughs> we've tried to pick readings that stir up some, you know, some dialogue and that, and that really get at some of the realities of healthcare, both, both good and bad. And so uh, tonight what um, Wendy and I will talk about is some of that Paradox. Health, the U.S. healthcare system, in particular, is the, the, the best word I could use to describe it is a paradox. Um, it, it, it is at times shows you that it is is one of the you know the best systems uh, in the world, but more often I would say than not, uh, it is a system you know for which we spend an awful lot of money and, and don't get the results uh, that other countries get for their healthcare. And so uh, you know we can talk a little bit about why that's the case tonight in, in the Q&A. Um, so that's us. Okay, so if, if any of you are Clint Eastwood fans, this is uh, titled My Talk, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Uh, and I think that that's, that's a good name for uh, U.S. healthcare. That, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what each of those means as we, as we move on. Uh, Wendy and I are gonna throw some statistics at you. Many of you may have already seen this, you may have already been aware of this, but you know, nothing beats a good graph, nothing beats a good uh, trend line to really drive home the points you want to make. And, and this one always you know, gets me, it's near and dear to my heart. Frankly, all it says is we spend way more than any other country on healthcare, and these are developed countries. Um, uh, you know, we pay twice as much than, than most of the developed countries in this list. Uh, and as you'll see through Wendy's slides and a few of my slides and discussion, uh, we don't get the kinds of results that other countries get for spending much less. Where does all this money go? This is a, you know, a nice pie chart. Uh, half of it goes to doctors and hospitals. Okay, and, and that's no surprise because our healthcare system is built on you know what Paul Starr called you know the medical model of care, which is uh, you know basically the acute care system. We wait until people get sick, and then we take care of them. Uh, and you know, in that kind of system, the, the players that really benefit the most and are at the, the heart of healthcare delivery in that kind of system are physicians, most notably specialties, specialists as opposed to primary care physicians, and hospitals. Okay. Um, you know, as you look on this, this chart, you'll see, um, you know, we don't have a government-run healthcare system. Uh, government administration makes up 1% of the, the healthcare spending in this country. If you look, look at a program like Medicare, you know, one of the faults of, of you know, people talk about Medicare waste, well, what researchers have shown and, and policymakers have talked about is there's a lot of waste in Medicare simply because the uh, oversight apparatus in Medicare you know, which would be government, you know, monitoring the program, is it sufficient that, that very little funding is devoted in Medicare to actually overseeing the program. So the reality is that, you know, a good chunk of the health care bill in this country goes right down to two groups of providers, hospitals and physicians. Uh, public health, you can see, 
um, you know, gets a very small slice of the pie. Yet I would say, you know, when you, it delivers the biggest bang for the buck, and we'll talk about that through this semester. Why don't we invest more in public health when it pays such big dividends, uh, especially at a population level? Things like immunization, uh, wellness, uh, you know, uh, public health approaches, screening, mass screening of individuals for different health care um, uh, diseases and conditions. But yet we invest, we still continue to invest so little in it. Uh, and then nursing home care, home health care, uh, and as you could probably guess, with our uh, nation aging, these will be uh, segments of the pie that are going to dramatically grow in the future over the next couple of decades. And so one of the questions when you look at something like this is not just where does the money go now, but for the future, how is the pie going to change? And if you can anticipate that things like home health care, nursing home care, uh, other health, residential, personal care, uh, the things that may filter into things like long-term care uh, are going to grow significantly, then the question will become what part of the pie is going to decrease to absorb that increase in expenditures? So are we going to keep the pie the same size and just redistribute? Uh, or is the pie going to inevitably get bigger? And, and that's, that's an essential question. Traditionally, right, the pie gets bigger, doesn't get smaller. And we'll talk a little bit next week, and we'll talk a little bit in this course about whether Obamacare, as it's called, healthcare reform, will help us bend that cost curve down so that this pie can, you know, stay at the same size. For example, you know, many people think the implement implementation of healthcare reform le uh, legislation will mean uh, less revenue, less reimbursement for hospitals and doctors over time. And so, if that money can be reallocated into other parts of the system without increasing over a health care dollar, fine. If it can be reallocated to things like long-term care, uh, while in the process actually saving some money, even better. But, but this is the question. Will the pie continue to get bigger? Will it stabilize? Will it get smaller? There's no doubt there'll be some redistribution that's going to occur. It's another, I like this graph as well. Uh, this is what I like about graphs. You can make any graph you want to do to look any way you want, and so this is kind of this is kind of a, somebody made this graph up, uh, you know. But I, I like it because what it shows is that you know you have per capita spending, okay. So what each of the countries spends, oops, and then you have, and that's the the uh, purple line, and then you have life expectancy in each of the countries. And as you can see, a lot of lot more spending, a lot lower life expectancy. Um, what this tells me is. If I was an venture capitalist and I was investing in, you know, where would I invest to get the best bang for my buck in terms of long life based on how much healthcare spending I invest, I would not, the U.S. would be a bad investment, okay? There'd be many other countries that I could go to uh, where I could get a better return on my dollar. So it's not just that we spend an awful lot, okay? It's that we don't also get the results you would expect if you spend an awful lot. Uh, Wendy, Wendy will also go into this with some, some really nice uh, uh, slides. Um, I'll only say that uh, compared to other peer countries, um, and most of those countries are you know, developed countries like, like European countries and, and developed countries in Asia, um, we fare worse on pretty much every indicator you want to look at. Fare worse in infant mortality, number of violent deaths, uh, rates of HIV AIDS, uh, substance abuse problems, uh, and the impact of chronic disease. So, um, you know, we, we invest a lot, like I said, and yet we do worse. Uh, and it's not all, you know, the, the question then becomes, well, what's the reason for that? Um, but certainly from a money standpoint, from an investment standpoint, we, we, <coughs> we don't get the return that we might expect. However, where we do do better than other countries on is survival after age 75. And I, I read an article in preparing for this. Um, the, some of this data I'm talking about comes from the International Federation of Health Plans, uh, which is this organization of, of health plans across different countries, health insurance plans. And they get together and they basically you know, provide these statistics. And what I liked about this article, you know, this article basically said, you know, the U.S. healthcare system is great if you can make it to the age of 75. 
you know, <laughs> then you're in good shape because then you, you'll be in the best he healthcare system in the world in terms of outcomes. Reasons for that is one, we do have a Medicare program that provides very good care for older adults, okay? Medicare is, is a tremendous program. It's been a tremendous program in improving uh, longevity, lifespan. Um, it's a very generous program, okay? Um, but, you know, in this same article, the author was also saying, you know, there's also some probably Darwinian selection in this too. <laughs> if you can make it, if you make it to 75, chances are on average you may be in better health, you may be a healthier person, and so you're likely to, to live longer anyway. Um, so whatever the reason, it's, it's something we excel on. If we make it as a, as a, as a populist age 75, we, uh, we outperform other countries in terms of some of these uh, indicators and lifespan. Uh, we also do well on some of the things that we have as a system really concentrated on, right? Um, things like the control of high blood pressure, uh, control of cholesterol, ca higher cancer. We have better cancer survival rates than other developed countries, lower smoking rates. It's not a coincidence when you look at these things in that bullet. These are things we've made major investments in. These are also things we've, we've had major uh, regulatory uh, interventions for, right? Smoking, for example. Uh, and there's probably been no more focused on uh, you know, chronic disease um, intervention than the control of high blood pressure and cholesterol in this country. So what, it, what this tells me is that when we set our minds to something, to really sort of trying to do something well, um, for whatever reason, we can do pretty good, and that's encouraging. All right, so so what's the deal though in terms of you know this whole notion of you know we spend a lot, we don't get the results other countries get. There's a lot of different reasons that a lot of different people write about, um, a lot of different people do research on. Um, you know, first it's clear we don't get value for the dollar spent. The big buzzword now in healthcare is value. Right? If you look at health reform, if you look at how state and federal governments talk about reforming health care, if you look at how places like CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, talk about it, uh, how private insurers talk about it, it's all about value, delivering more value, 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 value. We have value-based purchasing. We have you know, judging value in terms of measurement. Um, you know, to me, value means three things, quality of care, clinical quality of care, patient satisfaction, and people's quality of life. And those things aren't necessarily, as we know, completely correlated with each other, all right? Uh, people can feel really good about the health care they get and get lousy health care, right? The, the, the research I like to look at is, is research that's been done recently. You know, I do some work in the patient safety area that patients are much less likely to sue their doctor or their institutions when a mistake is made. Um, when the doctor and institution apologize, are proactive in how they interact with the patient and their family, are right up front in addressing the mistake that was made. And this is regardless of how egregious the mistake is. So what that research says is it's not, it's not just about whether you have a medical error committed on you, it's how the, the system treats you once they find out that they've made an error, okay? But there's a situation where you have poor quality of care, and yet you may have higher patient satisfaction even in, a, even in an instance of poor quality of care. Um, so we have these paradoxes, but it's, it's clear that when you look at data on all these things, we're down, all right? Um, we have real patient satisfaction problems in this country. Um, we, have, we still have quality of care issues, although we've gotten better in a lot of areas, um, particularly in some of the surgical areas, um, but we still don't get, people generally agree, we don't get value for the dollar spent. One problem is, right, this whole medical model of care. The emphasis on the curative, not on the preventive. The classic example of that in our healthcare system is the, you know, the continuing dismantling and demise of primary care in this country. And this is a topic that I study about, or I did a book about it. Um, you know, pr primary care, you know, the old, you know, going back, everything from Marcus Welby, right, the, the, the you know, I like to tell my students the number one show on TV in, in the early 1970s was about a primary care doctor. All right, now the number one shows on TV are about surgeons and people who work in hospitals and about the guy who walks around with a cane who is a 
genius who figures everything out, right? House who, who you know, if you, if, would you ever want him as your doctor? I mean, <laughs> he's kind of a creepy guy, and you know, um, but he's a genius, right? And he figures out everything. But this cultural shift in what we like to look at with our doctors belies the true underlying reality that we don't, we haven't cared much about primary care in this country for a really long time. And that's a problem. Uh, because primary care, the things you do in primary care, prevention, you know, public health approaches, trying to keep people healthy, trying to promote wellness, um, chronic disease management, these are the things that have been shown to reduce costs in the system and lead to better outcomes for the population as a whole. And this is what other this is one of the things other countries' healthcare systems emphasize much better than we do. You know, in the UK, for example, you don't go to medical school and you know, say, hey, I'm gonna become a surgeon. The UK basically doles out how many, you know, basically you're becoming a primary care doctor. And, and you only will become a surgeon or a specialist if you know, there's allotments that are available, if you get selected, but you know, basically you go to school to become a primary care doctor. That's not the way it is in this country. In this country now, you go to school to become a high paying specialist. Primary, becoming a primary care doctor is often viewed as consolation prize. All right, so, but this is an example of how we've sort of moved away from this whole uh, notion on keeping people healthy, promoting wellness, and really on waiting until they get sick and taking care of them, the acute model of care. Fragmented delivery system. You know, this is another area that I, like, you know, I study because I study physicians. We have, on record, we have 38 uh, board specialties in medicine, and, a, and within that, we have another 124 subspecialties. So we have 124 different brands of doctors. If you look at the field of pediatrics and the field of internal medicine, it's all you need to look at. There's a pediatrician for every single organ of the body almost. There's an, internal there's an internist for almost every single organ of the body. And this leads to a fragmented delivery system. And a fragmented delivery system leads to a costly delivery system. A close relative of mine has celiac disease, okay? Went undiagnosed for first 40 years of their life was only found out after this person went through 15 years of going to seven different specialists to treat seven different kinds of symptoms. They thought she had rheumatoid arthritis, they thought she had reflux, they thought she had asthma, they thought she had all these different things. Turned out she had one thing, celiac disease. As soon as they corrected that, took her, put her on a special diet, did other things, all these other symptoms went away. Why is it that the healthcare system didn't recognize that disease sooner? A disease, by the way, that because it went undiagnosed, cost countless thousands of dollars. This person going to different specialists who never talked to each other, who never compared notes, who never chatted up the patient, right? So this is where we're at in healthcare in the United States. Fragmentation, okay? Um, and it's a, it's a serious problem, uh, and it leads to a costly system and not a system necessarily that breeds a healthy patient. The other problem is customers being removed from the cost of care, right? Insurance has been the prime, you know, the great thing about insurance is it's given people access to care and good care. Bad thing about insurance over time is it's removed us from the cost of care. You know, if, if I told you you could go into a car dealership or you could pick any car you wanted, a Mercedes, a BMW, a Rolls Royce, a Prius, all right, a Ford Focus, all you had to pay was 100 bucks for any of the cars. Would you pick the Ford Focus or would you pick the Mercedes? I would say, you know, you'd probably end up picking the Mercedes. Why? Because it, every car costs you 100 bucks. Why not go for the best? This is, in some ways, this is the kind of health insurance we have. Okay, now that's starting to change because employers, insurers are waking up. We now have these things called high deductible health plans. We have health plans, you know, health insurance plans now. The out of pocket expense is much greater. And, when, and what you see in those situations is utilization go way down. Not necessarily a good way, but what it proves is the point that when you put the consumer in touch with the price of health care, they think harder on it. They think about what they're doing. And consumers being removed from care, the cost of care, has been a contributory factor in how expensive it's gotten. These are some of the realities. Um, health care prices, you know, the, the one I'll, I'll talk about here is, um, you know, health care prices are out of control. I did a... You know, Time, I don't know if people read the Time Magazine piece a while back about the prices in healthcare. Okay, well, if you compare these prices, bypass surgery in this country, the average price paid for it is around $73,000. In the UK, it's 14000 
Hip replacement, $40,000 here versus 11000 in the UK. C-sections, 15000 here. This is the average price that's paid to insurers versus five k um, in the UK. Uh, MRI, $1,100 average reimbursement here versus $300 in the UK. And I picked the UK as just an example, but this is, it's more expensive than any other country, uh, developed country that we're looking at. So healthcare prices in this country are out of control. Again, we could debate the reasons why, but the fact is people are paying a lot more for the same thing that they could get a lot cheaper in another country. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to touch upon is just the whole notion of, this I think is a very alarming reality, um, persons covered by employer-sponsored employer insurance is, is decreasing dramatically. Okay, over a 10 year span, it went down 11 million, uh, 11 million people. Not covered anymore. Now people say, well, Obamacare will help fix that. Well, it will to some extent. But the fact is, there are a lot of you know, working poor that will not be able to buy or afford coverage through these health exchanges, even with the subsidies. Um, and they're working full time for companies that simply will not offer them health insurance. Retiree, retiree health insurance, that'll be a myth by the time I, I reach retirement age. That will be gone. I just read an article about the Detroit bankruptcy, okay? And one of the things, oops, that the city of Detroit forgot to reveal and that most localities don't reveal is it's called, I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to get the, uh, it's called other uh, personal employment benefits. These are things besides pension benefits that localities owe their workers after they retire. The biggest chunk of that are, are health care expenses when, when city workers and, and, and municipal workers retire. Most localities don't, didn't have to report this in the past on, on their balance sheets. Now they have to. Detroit has like it, it, the fourth highest in, in terms of the amount of unfunded payments for health care for their retirees. Guess who's right ahead of them? Boston, city of Boston. Boston's the third. Boston, let me get the actual figure here. It is, oh, I think I left it right over here. $19,000 per household in the city of Boston is the unfunded amount owed on health care for retired Boston employees. And basically what they said is localities don't have any money to pay this. They, they haven't kept any reserves because they haven't been required to, like they are required to for pension reserves. So what's going to happen in the future is the rules are going to get changed. Retirees are going to lose their health care coverage. And, and private sector employers have already started doing this, right? GM gave over all their retiree health benefits to the UAW in a, in a labor deal six years ago. You know, basically said, you take it over. We'll give you a certain chunk of money, but we're out. We don't, we're not going to provide health care for, for uh, our retired employees anymore. So what, what does that mean? That means Medicare as a program is going to be increasingly relied upon to provide coverage for older adults who tend to be the highest utilizers of care. So people who think that Medicare you know, is going to be able to shrink as a program, no, it's going to become probably the biggest program, way bigger than it even is now. That's a, re that's a reality that we really need to think about because Obamacare and healthcare reform isn't necessarily addressing that issue. Okay, so let me spend a, a few minutes just talking about some of the explanations, okay? Um, so you have some of the information. I'm a sociologist, so I like to focus on sociological explanations uh, first because, of course, sociologists think everything's sociological. Economists think everything's uh, economics. Um, why do we have this kind of healthcare system? Okay, the, the, the kind that we've talked about a little bit that Wendy's gonna talk about. Well, one of, one of the sociological explanations is this whole sort of American way of doing things, right? This whole rugged individualism. We, we have a system that's largely left a lot of people uninsured, um, left a, a fragmented hodgepodge of people with different kinds of insurance co uh, coverages, different access, you know, differential levels of access to care. And one of the reasons for that is just our cultural norm in this country of sort of, you know, you pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Um, you know, if you, if you really need to get good health insurance, you'll find a way to get it. If you really need to get access to good care, you'll find a way to get it. Um, you know, and, and, and that's just, I, I do it, she does it, you can do it, okay? And, and that kind of attitude is, is very problematic in a healthcare marketplace that 
doesn't provide equal opportunity for everyone to get health care. This is one of the, I think, really valuable things about the health care legislation. It will at least try and level the playing field somewhat, although imperfectly, uh, to try and give more people a chance to get buy into some kind of health care insurance. Look what it's done already to, to young, you know, young kids being able, you know, up to the age of 26 to be able to go on their parents' health insurance. Right? What? Some, some, somewhere on the order of 5 million uh, people between the age of 21 and 26 took advantage of that. That's a big deal. So that's one thing, the, the whole notion of this individualistic society. The infrastructures we have are not amenable to health. Okay. The big example of this in public health, I, I had some colleagues back at the school I used to be at that did a lot of work in sort of uh, walkable communities. Boston's a very walkable, well, I don't know. Sometimes I think it is when, when I'm crossing streets. I, <laughs> I think, wow, you, I take your life in your hands in this, in this city. But it's a lot more walkable than, you know, if you go, most people go home, they might go home to a suburb, right? A place where I live doesn't even have sidewalks. Okay, how can it be a walkable community if there's not sidewalks? And so th this is a problem. We don't have infrastructures anymore, you know, the location of parks, places where people can go and, and exercise. Um, these are things that, you know, our infrastructure has been tailored around the automobile, not around the individual. And that's, that's clear in, in if, when you look at our infrastructure. Um, and it's a real problem because it hasn't encouraged things like physical activity uh, and people, you know, exercising, et cetera. Um, media gratification culture. I don't think I need to say much about that. I mean, we live in an age where, you know, everything is now, now, now. And technology has fostered that. Um, but, you know, social networking, our ability to connect quicker. But, you know, that kind of culture is not amenable to necessarily all of us doing something in a preventive way that might help us 20 years from now be healthier, but may not have any effect on us right at this moment, okay? The fact is that wellness and good health care is a long running proposition. It takes a while. All right? It's a bet. You make a bet on the future. And, and that goes against how many of us sort of live our lives now. You know, constant uh, you know, um, movement, so to speak. Uh, poverty in this country is at an all time high. All right? the, the level of poverty in this country is twice as much what it is in other developed countries. Okay, especially among children, all right? And poverty is very much correlated with, you know, poor health, poor access to health. Um, so, you know, that combined with the lack of social mobility, uh, you know, these, we're going through the first generations since, you know, the war, World War II, where children, the children of, of their parents may not be able to, uh, you know, leap over them in terms of social mobility. They may actually take a step backwards, okay? And, and that lack of social mobility <coughs> impacts the health of our population. Uh, economic explanations. This goes with sort of the immediate gratification, but, but we are in a consumer consumption-driven economy, right? We are an advanced capitalist system. And in that system, it's all about consumption. Consumption, consumption, consumption. So, you know, we want to eat fast, we want to drive fast, with, you know, the, the, what I call the selling of unhealthy lifestyles is in vogue. Yeah, you, you see commercials that say, you know, run and, you know, get out there and exercise, and it's, but it's like, go run a marathon. You know, you've never run before, go run 26 miles. It's not like run every day for a little bit of time or take a walk for 30 minutes or, you know, maybe look at the sunshine and relax and blow the cobwebs out of your head for the day. It's like, no, get a pair of sneakers, go run, do a triathlon, you know, just go extreme. And you know that is not necessarily the way to reach a wide audience in terms of the message of you know physical exercise is good, um, you know. And so in a way, we have an economy that promotes either implicitly or explicitly unhealthy lifestyles. Um, and then the fragmentation issue, right, which I've talked about. Insurance has been a great thing, but it's we have so many different insurances in this country now. So many people covered under different rules, and again, the legislation of Obamacare is going to address some of this. Um, but insurance has really fragmented people's care to the point where, you know, if I talk to you and you talk to me and we had different insurances, I wouldn't be able to, to know what you can do or what you can't do in terms of your own medical care or health. And that's a problem, and that's fostered fragmentation. You have different insurance companies vying for the hospital dollar, the physician dollar. 
it, it, it sets up a competitive system that fragments care delivery. Uh, and then the separation of public health from medicine, right? About you know, the turn of the century, public health and medicine, turn of the 20th century, public health and medicine were right there. It was a race, and they were competing right alongside each other. You know, 113 you know, years later, medicine's way ahead. And that, that's a great thing in a lot of ways, but for a population-based approach to keeping people well, um, the field of public health needs to have more attention paid to it. So I'll, I'll finish with this. You know, what, what should we build on? <coughs> Medicare is a successful program. It, it's been proven to be successful. Now it's, it's becoming larger and larger, but it's, it's because it's, it's so good at what it does. <laughs> um, certainly prices have to be controlled, but it, it largely has kept people um, lengthen their lives, lengthen their quality of life. That's led to more service utilization. That's not a bad thing, um, but there's a lot of things in Medicare that we can build on in terms of a model for how to provide health care for a large group of individuals. Uh, people's lifespans have gotten longer, okay? Um, their research shows that giving people insurance and access to care actually improves their lives, improves quality of life, lengthens life. We have an exceptional acute care system in this country. Um, we really know how to take care of people when they're sick. When they're really sick, we, we also really know how to take care of people. And that's a good thing. Um, and we are starting to focus on new definitions of value. We're starting to understand things like how should we measure good healthcare performance? What really is a good health outcome for an individual? Uh, you know, and we're starting to be able to measure that. And when we can measure it, we can start to hold the people who deliver healthcare more accountable. We can start to make it more transparent so everybody can see it. And that's a really good thing, especially in a competitive system because you could argue in a competitive system, right? A competitive system benefits from open, free information, right? That's one of the sort of precepts of economics, you know, that, that a perfectly competitive system, information, the same information is available to everybody to make choices. So um, in conclusion, I mean, we can talk more about this. You'll hear more about this during the semester, but we need to shift financing more prevention and basic care. We need to revitalize primary care in this country, and that's going to mean shifting money away from specialty care. Okay, states like Oregon already do this. All right, they have, you know, and, and that means the word ration. We are going to need to, in, in this country, to shift, you know, dollars without blowing up the pie bigger. There is going to have to be some rationing care from one type of care to another type of care. Prices are going to have to be addressed. The fact is, we pay way too much for health care in this country. And when you look at the underlying cost structures, there's no explanation why, other than people can charge what they can charge. I've seen enough in my short research time span to know we need to give health insurance to everybody, okay? Because that will help drive down costs of care. People get more access to care, they get care when they need it, they stay healthier, costs of acute care go down. Uh, we haven't talked about this much, but people, the general public has to get more engaged in their care and take greater responsibility. I think we're on the precipice of a, of a moment in time where there will be more accountability and insurance companies will make it so uh, because they're not gonna pay anymore for you know, unhealthy lifestyles. You can imagine 20 years from now that there will be much more of an emphasis on you know, making sure that individuals take good care of themselves if they wanna get access to care. Um, whether you feel that that's right or wrong, it, it, it's gonna happen, it's already happening. Um, we need more system integration, and that's you know a big issue. How we get there, but you know we talk about these things like accountable care organizations, medical homes. Uh, we need to bring doctors, hospitals, long-term care. We need to bring them all together. We need them to share risk, and we need them to accept payment in a way that allows them to divide up how they want to spend it, but at the same time holds that holds them accountable if they spend too much. Um, and then the last one. I think it's a no-brainer. How we get there, I don't know. We'll do some of the, you know, some of these. I think every session will touch upon this a little bit, um, but I'm going to stop there and turn it over to Wendy.